Hi everyone, welcome back to Ramon Reviews, or as the channel may be called, Ramon Reads. Uh, today's episode, we're going to be talking about The Fisherman by John Flanagan. Kind of hard to see here. Uh, this is a horror novel that released in 2016, uh, and it does have uh, uh, a very nested element uh, inside of it. Uh, and we're going to find out today uh, if this is some, something that you should add to your to-be-read list, or if it's something that you should avoid. Uh, and I'll give you my slightly spoilerish thoughts on uh, that matter. Uh, so let's dive in. So, uh, The Fisherman is a book that is not very long, necessarily, but it is very dense. Uh, and the reason I say that is because uh, it, it starts with the first-person narrative. Uh, we have Abe, uh, the main character, who is telling us uh, his, his process of grief, his, uh, his process of loss. Uh, he lost his wife after being married to her for a very short period of time, uh, he lost his wife to cancer. Uh, and uh, it starts off with him narrating and then quickly turns into another story being told to uh, Abe, uh, and then even another story being described from this other narrator. So it's, it's very nested uh, as far as the stories and the narratives go. And, and in that respect, it's very much a story about tall tales about uh, fairy tales, which uh, may, be give, may be giving the wrong impression. Um, it is also a very Lovecraftian type of story, a very supernatural and otherworldly uh, type of story. And I have to be honest, uh, there was a period of time where I had to stop reading the book uh, because it was, uh, it was a little much. Um, and, and I mean that in the best, absolute best possible way. Uh, I usually do a lot of my reading before I go to sleep, and reading this book was a little too intense at moments to keep doing that and not worry that I was going to lose sleep or not worry that I was going to be uh, dreaming uh, about what was happening in the uh, in the book itself. Um, it, it is also a title that I uh, I put off reading. Uh, I keeps uh, I kept seeing it on people's lists of highly reviewed books or highly reviewed for for the year and the the cover uh as you may have uh, glanced at at the beginning of the video is a boat uh and the the whole description uh, of it is you know you get you get the title the fisherman uh and you think that you're going to be reading a book about fishing you think uh well it made me think anyway that i was going to be reading a book about someone cast out at sea and the horrors of the deep which I am absolutely terrified of things that you can't see in the dark of water, like I think uh, many people are. And so for that reason, I, I'm not interested in fishing. I'm not interested in people, stories about people being out, cast out at sea. Uh, I'm not going to be rereading Moby Dick anytime soon. Uh, and, and so I kept putting it off, I kept putting it off, uh, and then I finally uh, broke down and said, you know, I'm going to give this a shot. And I also thought that potentially the, the themes of grief would be too much, a little too heavy. Uh, and there is certainly a lot to add to that rather than just Abe's uh, experience with, uh, with the, the loss of his wife. Um, but honestly, it was so compelling. It was such a, such a, a driving force of a story that I kept having to read more and more and more. Um, it also took me quite a while to get through it. Uh, it, it is not very long. I think uh, it, it is actually under 300 pages. The, um, the issue is that there's not a lot of dialogue that happens in the book because it is heavily being told as a tale, told as a story. It may be slightly contemporary. Uh, I, I think it is actually set in the late um, uh, or early 2000s, uh, late 90s, uh, as far as the, the time place for the story itself. Uh, but like any good story, it feeds a little bit of the future. It feeds a little bit of the, uh, the future details that you're going to come across in the broader 
story. Um, and to that end, it is a very dense read. And I don't think that's going to be for everybody. I think there are going to be some people who do get put off by the fact that there isn't a lot of char character dialogue uh, at initially, um, at, at least. Uh, there is much more uh, conversation to be had in the middle of the story or in the meat of the story. Um, so that may put some people off. Uh, I know it surprisingly took me a very long time to get through this. It also surprisingly took me a very long time to put this video together uh, and start taking notes. Uh, I was about 20% through and I had most of my notes uh, set aside for uh, things that I wanted to talk about. Uh, and I was only about 20% of the way through the, the, the book itself. So it is very dense because those paragraphs are packed with story and with description of what took place or what's happening. So we, uh, we meet Abe. Uh, he is our, our main character. Uh, he's being described as working at IBM uh, in, uh, in an earlier time uh, when IBM was a place that was a little more lax. Uh, so uh, they, they did give him a lot of uh, uh, time off uh, for grieving. And he, uh, he starts off the story uh, with, uh, we, we start to learn these details about him, uh, but he also starts the story with suddenly waking up one morning with an ache to go fishing. And it's, it, it is something that just sticks in the side of his body uh, mentally and drives him to go fishing. And he hasn't been fishing since he was a young, uh, young boy with his father. So he doesn't know where this desire really comes from. But it turns into this peace for him. So he goes out, he gets the gear, he gets, he starts to be a beginner and, and you're being told this uh, within the first uh, probably 10, 15 pages. Uh, he, he definitely becomes a, a beginning learning fisherman. Uh, and he starts, uh, he starts fishing around cre creeks in um, the area that he lives. He's supposed to work at IBM in uh, Poughkeepsie. Uh, and it's, uh, it, it's this ache that starts to override um, the, the actual loss. Uh, the uh, the loss of his wife, uh, which is described in one passage, uh, he describes the loss as feeling like someone reached into the back of your mouth with pliers and tore out a molar. It's an open wound that ached all the way through you. It's an open wound that you can't help but just keep fishing your tongue around in your mouth, probing at it, and you know that it hurts, but it's still there and it's still gone. Uh, and I, I thought that was such a uh, there's there's another passage uh, a little bit later that I'll share as well uh, that dives into how the characters describe loss, uh, and I'll I'll share that as uh, as part of this video as well. And so he he starts to develop this piece with fishing, uh, and he fishes around ponds and creeks uh, in the upper state uh, New York area, uh, and it is something that also helps him to connect with all those feelings that he tamped down while the slow agonizing loss of his wife to cancer was taking place. He had to be present for her. He had to be strong for her. When the funeral happened, he had to be strong. He had to, uh, he had to keep going through the motions of the planning and move on, moving on to the next piece of the funeral arrangements. And so the, the fishing not only becomes a chance for him to kind of get away from all the pressure of the loss, but also as a way to confront it and to grieve and to have those quiet moments where he can come to terms with that heavy feeling, that heavy loss. So this is where we have our character. Um, we get introduced to a, a secondary character uh, named Dan, who is a coworker at the office. And Dan is described as being younger than he is. He's also described as being, uh, extremely tall. Uh, I believe it was six, seven, uh, is how he's described. And Dan, Dan is a young man who also has, uh, a family. Uh, he's, he's got a child. He has, uh, he has a young wife. Uh, he's got everything to look forward to, uh, ahead of him. And Dan loses his family in a car accident at one of those intersections that has, 
uh, unexpected stop signs, but it really should have a traffic light. Uh, and the irony is that after this accident, uh, where he loses his entire family, because he happens to be the one that when they were driving to breakfast, he decided not to put on his seatbelt. And he becomes the one that lives because he got pushed from the accident. Um, and the irony is that after this accident, uh, he, uh, uh, there is a traffic light that gets installed at that intersection. Uh, and this becomes a, a point of really just a, uh, Dan's one of darkest moments, uh, a little bit later on in the, uh, in the narrative where he can't handle the grief and he starts, uh, every, every morning before work, he grabs a coffee and he just sits there at the intersection parked to the side of the road, just staring at the light. And that's what he does unhealthily uh, along with drinking, which is something that the, the main character also uh, was uh, described as, as doing uh, as a way to cope uh, before they found fishing. So at, at some point, uh, our main character, Abe, invites Dan over on a fishing trip and Dan reluctantly agrees, but he decides to do it and they don't, they don't talk much uh, at, at first. They're just kind of alone and quiet in their, in, in each, in their own separate grief. Uh, and eventually they do start to open up to each other. Uh, Abe has to constantly be careful about the, the questions that he asks and the things that he says um, before uh, Dan starts to feel comfortable even talking about it. And even that, um, even that is something that uh, will still be touch and go because Dan will suddenly not want to answer something or uh, will uh, just clam up, will just uh, completely close up and, and not want to say anything. Um, so it, it's a story about these two, um, two adults who are processing the loss of their respective wives or respective loved ones in very different ways. Um, for Abe, he doesn't feel appropriate going to Dan to tell him things like uh, platitudes, like I know how you feel, or um, I'm also feeling lost. Uh, he doesn't feel comfortable expressing that because he lost his loved one in a very different manner. He lost his loved one in a very slow, processable way, as much as you can process uh, the loss of someone that you're, you're watching um, kind of wilt uh, in front of your eyes versus Dan lost his family all at once. Um, and so he doesn't, he feels guilty even thinking about trying to approach Dan and have that kind of conversation with them. So it is in the fishing together that they start to find this solidarity, that they start to find this, this friendship. Um, and, um, what happens, uh, in the narrative is that the, the fishing season, um, ends. And so they return back to office life and that's where Dan sorts, uh, Dan, the secondary character, starts to kind of spiral. He starts to retreat back into himself, retreat back into the loss, retreat back into drinking and uh, siloing himself off away from family. And he's also at risk of losing his job uh, because he's coming to work more and more disheveled uh, with clothes that he wore the day before. Um, and and Abe notices this. He, he knows what's going on. He, he tries to get him to come out. He tries to get him to come to his home um, in between these, uh, these off seasons. Um, eventually, fishing season returns the following year, uh, and Abe is surprisingly there. First thing asking, or Dan, I should say, is there first thing asking Abe, when does fishing start? I want to come with you. Um, and, and this was after they've, they've already had a moment where... Uh, uh, Dan did come over and accept Abe's invitation to come over one time uh, and had a very uh, uh, a very huge breakdown of, uh, of emotions and anger. Uh, and, and so uh, to, to Abe's, uh, Abe's thoughts, uh, I'm never going to see Dan again. He's not going to come out of this. So what ends up happening is they, they start the new fishing season and Dan is adamant about trying some new creeks and trying some new areas. And he mentions one called Dutchman's Creek that is not on the map 
that Abe has, and it's not on many maps. And so Abe asks him how he found out about this, uh, this uh, creek and why he wants to fish there so bad. And he, he describes himself as not being the most, uh, most able to spot a lie, but he immediately knew that Dan was lying when he told them where he found out about this particular creek. Uh, but he agrees to take him, uh, and so they, they embark on this, uh, this fishing trip, and they stop at a diner that they have stopped at before to grab some breakfast before they actually start their fishing trip. And at the diner itself, it's an old school diner, um, the, uh, the cook comes out and he overhears or he asks them directly where they're headed. Um, and he just kind of gets this look of shock. Uh, Abe, uh, Abe describes it as a, he's never really seen somebody react this way in a very visceral way where the, the color just drains from the, the cook's face. Um, and he, again, just like Abe, tries to find out how Dan knows about this particular creek. Um, and so Dan lies again and tells him that he found it. Uh, he found, a me found it mentioned in this old fisherman's guide, fisherman guidebook, uh, that I guess is well known for the last 50, 60 years. Um, and, and so the cook, he, uh, he, he just kind of nods and he knows that, uh, Dan is lying and basically says something along the lines of, uh, you know, I've read that book many, many times. Um, I know that that creek doesn't seem to be mentioned in there, but maybe my memory is off. So this is where the nested story actually begins. He starts to tell them, and he, he tells them that he, he feels like he's compelled to tell them this story. He tells them a story about that particular creek and the town surrounding it um, that is set in the 1850s. And so it becomes this nested narrative, and then we have another character inside that story also relaying what happened on her deathbed much later after the 1850s. She finally relents and starts to uh, tell what actually occurred. And, and this is where the beginning of this uh, is told in, uh, I believe the book itself is told in three parts. The beginning of it, uh, you're, you're still in contemporary times, you're still dealing with Dan and Abe, um, and, and then we get to the diner, and I would consider that part two. Uh, I believe that's how the, the book breaks it down as well. That's where you get the, the story within a story, and this is where you are being taken back uh, a couple hundred years. Um, there's a there's a creek where uh, we have a we have a whole slew of characters. Uh, one of them is the rich farmer off to the side that um, is very gruff. Uh, he he is likely to uh, literally uh, punch you off his doorstep uh, as he is to tell you exactly what he wants and when he wants it, and he expects you to do it um, right away. Uh, and so. We, uh, we get this further narrative uh, in there, and there's not too much here that um, I do want to... Uh, there's not too much here that I do want to spoil, because I, I really think this is where you start getting into uh, the, the really messed up section of the story, where this truly becomes that Lovecraftian type of, uh, type of story. Um, Dutchman's Creek itself is uh, described as being near Woodstock, and it feeds into the Hudson, um, and... This, uh, this town that surrounds it eventually is a town that uh, is going to get flooded to make way for a dam. Uh, and so we, we also have that other creepy element of um, houses and buildings underwater in a lake that people don't even know about, um, which that itself doesn't play too much into the whole story itself. Uh, but it, uh, it just to illustrate that this is something that did occur in the past. Uh, we did have towns that were flooded to make way for progress. So um, in the in the book itself, uh, in the story within a story, we have a character who gets described as being run over by uh, wagons, being pulled by mules, uh, and for whatever reason she runs out into the middle of the street and she gets run down uh, in this town. And her body's completely broken. She uh, she 
um, she's, she suffers from her wounds and she dies, uh, I believe a day later, uh, in the book. And one of the characters in the, in the book, um, the, uh, the husband, uh, of, um, uh, this now, uh, deceased wife, which has its own, uh, of course, parallels there. Um, he decides that he's going to go off. Uh, and so he leaves his children or their children with a neighbor. And what happens in the story is that uh, around two or three in the morning, uh, early hours of the morning, um, after midnight, uh, they get a knock on the door and it's the father uh, asking to see his children. And he's telling them, you're going to be so excited about what, what you're about to see. There's, there's been a miracle. There's been a miracle. Um, and, and so the, um, the neighbors decide to let the children go because this is their father after all. Uh, and uh, we're, we're switching narratives at this point. Uh, so now we're being described uh, first person by one of the neighbors. Um, and he, uh, he describes this as... He should have known that something was wrong by the frenzied look in his neighbor's face when he was asking for his children to take them back home. Um, because as soon as they leave and they go to their house, that's when the screaming starts. And so he runs out of his house. He goes over to his neighbor's house uh, where the husband, where the, the father took his children um, and whose wife was run down by the cart. Um, and he opens the door and he, uh, you, you see, you have a scene where the father, the husband, just has his hands spread out with a grim grin on his face. Like he's apologizing, like he knows that he did something absolutely wrong that he shouldn't have, but it's too late to turn back now. And he's kind of half bowing. And in, right beside him in a chair is his wife who looks like her skin is wet um, and her legs are obviously still broken um, and she's alive and her eyes are kind of this gold color. Um, they, they don't have irises like normal people do. Uh, they would very much be described as being fish-like or um, uh, some type of uh, uh, amphibious creature. And so this is one of the scenes that opens up, kind of hereditary type of a uh, type of scene um, in the book itself. Uh, there is a later scene where uh, the the children and some other characters are holed up in a house, uh, and it's almost like a zombie attack. Um, the uh, the the dead returned to life uh, woman. Um, whose voice sounds like she's using a throat that's not used to uh, speaking words, um, is trying to get at the children. She just keeps hammering at this house uh, in the middle of the uh, middle of the night, and she's being described as walking around as somebody who is still trying to walk with their body and legs completely broken. Um, and, and so you have this uh, this very ring-like type of a uh, type of scene. Um, later on, we do have uh, creatures that you would expect out of Lovecraft. Uh, um, you have stories that um, that take place uh, inside this story. Like I said, it's very nested. It's very dense. Um, so, as far as my thoughts uh, on this book, uh, this is uh, this is a book that I very much enjoyed. Um, it did scare. The hell out of me in, in, a, in a couple of times in a, in a couple of uh, uh, chapters or, or scenes uh, in the in the story itself. Um, it was definitely something that I wanted to keep reading to see how far things would go, how messed up things would go. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily say that it's very gory. So if you're looking for something like that, uh, you, you're probably not going to find it here. Uh, but there are some very creepy elements. Uh, in, in fact, within the first few pages, um, the, uh, the main character has a dream of his wife um, or something that looks like his wife. And her skin is completely pale. She's got long wet hair, and when she turns around to smile at him, her jaw un just comes undone, and she's got rows and rows of needle sharp teeth. Um, and uh, it, it's just a very kind of creepy imagery um, that you keep encountering in this book. So this book really surprised me. Uh, it was not boring at all. Um, it also wasn't too heavy. Um, and, and I think that's a that's that mileage may vary from person to person. 
Um, I know for myself, uh, something that I've mentioned before in other videos is that um, sometimes your value of a piece of media, a story, a song, a book, uh, a movie is your personal connection to that. Um, so this was also a book that maybe I had to take a break uh, from reading um, because of uh, because of the horror of um, I lost uh, I lost my brother probably about oh, uh, 15, 16 years ago uh, and it was just completely um, uh, just a completely random act of violence that that happened. Um, and, and there were times where, uh, it, it's taken a lot to process, uh, that I, I do watercolor paintings and other type of, uh, mixed media stuff, um, and, uh, uh to, to kind of cope with it, you know, um, I've been doing that for the last 12 years. It is something that I very much tried, uh, I began as a way to process that. So I, I definitely got the fishing association with painting for myself, zoning out and creating something. Um, with that being said, there there are moments where the grief is like this sharp metal object and you put a veil over it. Time and acceptance puts a veil over it. Uh, every so often, it that little veil, that piece of cloth catches and it tears. And when that happens, it can hit you out of nowhere. You get hit with this immense grief that maybe never went away and maybe never will go away. But you know that over time, those sharp edges start to get a little duller. They start to get a little more manageable. So it is still sitting there inside of you. It's still a part of you. But the time and the acceptance keeps rounding off those edges, sanding down those edges, and you start to rearrange that piece of cloth over it. Uh, and you know it's still there, but it's not something that you have to look at all the time. And that was something that I, I have to struggle with, I have to balance with. Do I want to read this story about grief? Uh, how much can I handle um, out of this? Uh, so I very much connected in this, uh, connected to this story uh, with my own uh, grief. I don't absolutely don't think that's a, a prerequisite. Uh, uh, God no, to uh, to enjoy this. Uh, but if you do like things that are creepy, if you're a fan of Lovecraft, maybe not the person at all, uh, but that type of world building. If you're a fan of mythology, if you're a fan of stories uh, and storytelling, I definitely think you should give the the fisherman uh, a, a shot. Uh, you might be surprised. Uh, uh, again. I put this off for the longest time because I thought it would be boring because I don't want to read about somebody fishing. That's just me. Other people have different tastes. But I am so glad that I read this book. Uh, it is one of my favorite pieces of fiction, uh, especially, uh, definitely that I've read recently, uh, but probably of all time. Uh, and um, I, I know that's a, a lofty title to toss around, um, but I really do think if you give the fisherman a thought, uh, a shot, and you like the spooky, uh, it, it, it will likely be something that will stick with you uh, and will be something that you will remember and think on as time goes on. Before I forget, uh, I did want to throw in uh, the other passage that I knew uh, or that I mentioned uh, I would like to share um, as far as uh, the way that grief is described for one of the characters. This is for Dan. Um, as I mentioned for Abe, he describes it as someone reaching in with a pair of pliers and removing a molar, and it's something that you keep probing at, something that you know is there, and it's gone at the same time. Um, for Dan, um, this is uh, shortly after the uh, the time that, um, uh, after fishing season. Uh, so we have uh, one passage here. Dan's appearance, his state of mind, that Sunday night were the first signs of a change that overtook him during the next couple of months. To this day, I'm not sure exactly what triggered it, but his grief, kept at bay for so long, found a way to tunnel under Dan's defenses, and while he was otherwise distracted, seized the moment and fell on him, burying its sturdy teeth deep in his gut and refusing to let go. And I, just, I loved that description for describing the grief as something that just buried under his gut and 
latched onto him and just would not let go with its dirty teeth. Um, so as a, as a closing thought to this, uh, I, I do think this book is about um, the, uh, the themes of grief, but also how people process that and how one person's process of a terrible thing that happens can easily turn into a very toxic, toxic way to approach it. They start to sink into themselves. They start to lose and dissociate with everything else that's happening around them, and it becomes very unhealthy. Versus this acceptance sometimes of what happened has taken place, and I can't change that, but I can let it move me to the next page, move me to the next day, change my outlook on life, or change the way that I approach my life, change my own future. I, I, I do think it, it definitely speaks to here is a very toxic way to handle grief and loss. And here, eventually, hopefully, you can find acceptance. So again, Thank you for the little interjection here. Just wanted to tack this on as uh, closing thoughts. Uh, go read The Fisherman. You might love it. If not, please tell me why you didn't. Have a great night. Thank you.